how to use the interpretation feature for those of us viewing on Zoom tonight. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Buenas noches. Para escuchar en español, haz clic en el botón en el abajo de su pantalla que dice interpretation or interpretación. Marque Spanish para español. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Leadership Council San Mateo County is a countywide nonpartisan nonprofit leadership organization. We're dedicated to connecting leaders from the business, nonprofit, and government sectors to inspire them to find solutions to some of the biggest issues facing our county. We're proud to host this forum tonight, which is being held at the Half Moon Bay Library with an in-person audience. And we also have viewing locations in Spanish at Alas and Half Moon Bay and Puente at the Pescadero Community Church in Pescadero. This forum is also being broadcast by Pacific Coast Television and can be viewed in English and in Spanish via Zoom. For those of you who are attending in person, we please ask that you silence your phones if you haven't done so already. To ensure our Spanish language interpreters have time to translate moderator comments and questions and candidate statements and responses, we ask that all individuals speak clearly and at a moderate pace. We will also provide a brief pause between answers to allow the translators to finish their interpretation. Why did you speak the purpose of this candidates forum is to allow all candidates running for District 3 of the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors the opportunity to introduce themselves to voters and answer questions regarding issues facing our coastal communities. The term of office is four years. In the June primary, the top two vote getters will move on to the general election in November. If one candidate receives 50% of the vote plus one, that candidate will win the election in the primary. Okay, now this is a nonpartisan event which aims to provide voters with information from candidates so they yeah. can make informed decisions in voting. Therefore, we ask all in person participants to keep all expressions of support or opposition quiet for today's forum in order to allow each candidate to equally and fairly express their views. Before we introduce our monitors, we moderators, we would um, and candidates this evening, we'd like to recognize our community partners. We've had quite a few partners from our coast in our coastal communities to that helped us um, organize this evening. So we had the city of Half Moon Bay and the staff at the Half Moon Bay Library, Puente de la Costa Sur, Pacific Coast Television, the Half Moon Bay Review, Alas, Coastside Families Taking Action, Coastside Hope, Abundant Grace, Life Science Cares, and Thrive Alliance for Nonprofits in San Mateo County. I'd like to introduce our moderators for this evening. We have Aisha Burrow. Is he? Pardon me. Is Aisha Burrow is the executive director of Life Science Cares and Leadership Council San Mateo County Leadership Corps class member, and Eric Debode, who is the executive director at Abundant Grace Coastside Worker and also a Leadership Council San Mateo County Leadership Corps class member. And I'll hand it over to them. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aisha Barrow. And uh, we would like to begin by welcoming everybody and welcoming the candidates. Thank you for making the time today. So the candidates are, and I'm going to go in alphabetical order, not necessarily in the order in which you're sitting, but we have Stephen Booker, uh, Virginia Chang Kirali, Ray Mueller, and Laura Palmer Lohan. And then our translators are Brenda Graciano and Luis Romero. were submitted ahead of time by constituents. Um, and we sorted the questions by subject, but because of time constraints, we may not be able to go through all of the questions submitted. Um, so each candidate is going to have three minutes in that first half to respond to the question. So we wanted to give them an opportunity to go more in depth. Uh, if they don't utilize the time, uh, then we may have time for more questions. Um, and after that, there'll be an opportunity uh, for a 30 second follow up after each question has been answered. Um, so the order in which the candidates uh, are going to answer the question is going to alternate for each question so that everybody has an opportunity first. Um, and uh, we will be giving them notice um, at one minute, 
30 seconds and stop. So Ken will be doing that and he'll be holding up a sign. Um, so we ask that each candidate finish their sentence at the end of the allotted time. So look at Ken and he will let you know. For the second part of this evening, we will open questions to the audience in person. Questions will be submitted via the Zoom Q&A feature from our remote location and virtual attendees. In-person attendees can submit questions on index cards passed to one of our volunteers who are seated right here in the front. You want to raise your hand? Then? If you have a question, write it on an index card and hand it to one of them. Please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question, and one of them will come and collect your index card. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to the questions in this section. You will be given notice at 30 seconds and then to stop. Okay, let's begin. So now let's begin. It's time to go to the questions. So the first question is, uh, what will you do to address affordable housing on the coast side? It's been an issue that's been talked about a lot if you've been following the debate um, in Half Moon Bay. Um, and we want you to focus especially on a low income families with an annual income under 50K, uh, farm workers and the unhoused. So um, the first um, answer will be Laura Palmer. And then, so you know, we'll go to Virginia, then Ray, then Stephen. So Laura. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for having uh, me this evening. I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, housing is a really important uh, issue. Um, I've been a champion of this uh, for um, ever since I was elected in city council. I served uh, as mayor last year in San Carlos. And our community went from a community uh, where there was a call for moratorium on all development uh, when I was first elected, including housing, uh, to now the second most uh, asked for uh, need, unsolicited by our community members, is housing. Um, I did this through uh, working with the community and collecting uh, feedback and ensuring that every community member had an opportunity uh, to share their perspective. Um, and we held workshops and that type of thing. I recognize that housing is a what I call a big rock. It's an upstream issue, and we really do need to create more housing. On the coast side, I understand a, a rental home in Half Moon Bay goes for six thousand dollars a month, uh, and on a farm worker salary, that's just untenable. It makes it very difficult. Um, I was fortunate uh, to um, take a tour of uh, the South Coast um, on several occasions and get more familiar with some of the issues facing our farm workers. And I want to make sure that, they're, that they and their families have adequate housing stocks. Uh, there's uh, a land uh, that's up for sale, the Bay City Flowers, uh, which is about 20 acres. And I think the county has an opportunity to take a look at that, it has access to water. And I think that could be a really great location uh, to create affordable housing. Um, in addition, I attended the uh, Navigation uh, Center groundbreaking uh, last week in Redwood City, and this is a model organization. From the point of shovel in the ground uh, to that being up and running, uh, it will be completed within a 12-month time frame at a very reasonable cost and provide wraparound services for people who are currently unhoused and are facing challenges in their life. And the idea behind it is to give them a, a hand up so that they can get back on their feet and living a sustainable life. That's another example of something that I would um, pursue. Um, in addition, the Big Wave Project, I think, is an example of something that is um, very inspirational. Uh, people with intellectual disabilities um, are very much marginalized in our community. And um, I think uh, providing a space uh, that's safe for them uh, to be able to uh, develop new skills and be self-sustaining um, and uh, be in community with, with everyone else is also really important. <laughs> And I know that project has been a long time coming. So um, my approach here is to, again, uh, engage in respectful dialogue and make sure everyone in the community is heard and has an opportunity uh, to share their views and take the best ideas forward. So thank you for the opportunity. And now we'll go to Virginia. Thank you very much for the question. Housing is one of the important issues, not just on the coast, but in the county in general. And I look at housing uh, in terms of people who need housing or need a place to live, but also workforce housing, which I've had to deal with um, my firefighters. I serve on the San Mateo County Harbor District Board and the Menlo Park Fire Protection District Board. And I've seen um, our essential workers in Harbor Patrol crews and also firefighters uh, 
who need temporary housing. So I'm hoping that at least for me, that, that is a very important issue to, um, for being able to house our essential workers so that they're not leaving um, when they're exhausted or they need to be here for various reasons. Um, for the affordable housing piece, I'm actually a proponent of social housing. I believe that government can do a lot better, a lot better job in terms of efficiency and uses of their property. Um, so I think repurposing government property and public property for housing uh, could solve a lot of problems. A lot of these government properties, I'm, I'm thinking of one place in particular in South San Francisco, we had some of our Harbor Board meetings, like on the corner of El Camino and, and Arroyo, that property could have been used for uh, a housing project, mixed mixed income and mixed use as well. So social housing, I think, is an important element for solving our housing needs. Um, and actually, there's a state legislative bill there by Al Assemblyman Alex Lee, and I've spoken with him about that. And there are lots of issues that um, that need to be put in place that need to be resolved in terms of building and you know what kind of entity would be able to build so that it's not uh, constrained by special interests, if you will. So social housing would provide mixed use housing, and mixed income housing, or mixed use of the property and mixed income housing. Um, the, as Laura said, the big wave project is important as well. I, that, that project has been fraught with controversy over the last couple of decades, it seems, but I'm glad to see that I've met with some of the leaders there that it has come to fruition and it provides a need um, for those who are not able to be on their own and be as independent. This provides them the opportunity to do so. So whenever we can partner with a nonprofits and public agencies and um, private businesses like uh, Bay City Flowers to provide housing, uh, we should do that. Um, also, we should be able to, to find services that would support the housing and that would include infrastructure, parking and um, our roads. Okay, thank you. Um, now we'll go to Ray. <laughs> Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you this evening. Um, so I, I actually, in my background, I've, I've served 10 years as a city council member, and during that time period, I've been, I'm now in my third housing element. So I have a lot of experience actually working, bringing housing into a city. And uh, and so the first, and, and in my background, I served on the board of Life Move as one of the largest homeless service providers in the county. I also was appointed by the president of the state of California assembly to serve on the California tax credit allocation committee, whose job was to bring forth affordable housing projects. And I, I represented all the cities in the state on that, on that committee. And when you're looking at the county actually going ahead and, and providing affordable housing, the first thing is you need to be able to, to, to have land. Right, and so you need to make county land available. You can either buy that land or you can use surplus county land. Right now, I understand uh, Bay City Flowers is available. It's about it's about going to be about twenty one million dollars, though. It's not cheap. There's also county land down in Pescadero, frankly, where there's a lot of where <laughs> hello Pescadero, uh, where there's a lot of farm workers, and so we can go ahead and actually take advantage of that land there. Um, the next thing that I would tell you is you need to bring you need to bring money and resources to that, and so. Uh, that's something that the county just has to invest dollars in. It's done a good job of doing that already, but we need to make that ongoing commitment. And then what I would say uh, is that I want to change actually how we approach affordable housing as a county. So right now what we do is, is we create housing and then we charge people based on their tier, the very much they can afford to be in that housing. And what we found is if you actually look at the data, it doesn't or it doesn't actually be, uh, result in social mobility and economic and up, economic upward mobility. And so what we're doing in Menlo Park and what we've seen other jurisdictions do is actually implement community trust models that allows people to buy into their affordable housing. And then as time passes, see a bit of equity from that housing. And what that allows, and actually that's an indicator of whether or not a child is gonna go to college. And so those are the things that I wanna pursue uh, on the board. The other thing that I'd say, uh, want to pursue workforce and I'm out of time. <laughs> oh, yeah, several minutes. And so what I'd say is we also, it's not just about uh, farm worker housing, which is incredibly important, but also workforce housing here in your services. It's so important because right now, especially right now, when you're looking at the cost of transit and the cost of gas, people get stuck on islands. And so you have to build housing where services are. We have to build those here. I've actually, I'm endorsed by all the members of the Half Moon Bay City Council, and I've actually gone on their behalf 
the Diocese of San Francisco to talk with them about sites here in uh, downtown Half Moon Bay. And so those are the types of things uh, that we really need to focus on. In this race, I'm endorsed by Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. He actually helped bring the first movement project to the coast. And I'm gonna work with her to go ahead and bring an, another movement project. Thank you. And now Stephen Booker, your turn. Uh, thank you. I'm actually, of course, I'm a proponent for affordable housing. That's one of my main platforms. If you look at my website, um, affordable housing, housing at all affordability levels, but especially workforce housing and, and um, farm worker housing. You know, the farm worker agricultural industry brought in something like $50 billion in, in um, 2018 in California and uh, the coast side. We have a large agricultural uh, community here and we need to, they have housing insecurities and that's not right. Um, so we definitely need to have farm worker housing. We need to have workforce housing for our, for our teachers, for our essential workers. Um, and not only is it a health issue because COVID-19 showed us that when health, when the farm workers got COVID-19, the whole farm would get it because they couldn't self, they couldn't isolate. So we need to do that. We need to do it for our, for our essential workers so they don't have to travel 90 million miles back and forth to uh, serve us. And um, we need to do it for our for nurses and for our uh, educators. We have workforce housing like Jefferson High School is doing. They have uh, just did a affordable housing for their staff, which um, allows us to keep our best educators here, which uh, benefits our children for our futures. And it also cuts down on uh, travel, which cuts down on greenhouse gases. So just like my opponents or my colleagues, as I call them, my friends, we all know each other. We, we work together for, I don't know, I've known Ray for the last eight years, Virginia, where, uh, we all work together. So I know each and every one of us is um, in favor of affordable housing, but we definitely have to do it in um, public lands and where there's uh, transit hubs to cut down on greenhouse gases and, uh, and to cut down on climate control. So thank you for the question. And it's a pleasure being here in uh, Half Moon Bay Library, which is a net zero energy building, which was built by uh, all union labor, which is also helping to cut down uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So thank you for that. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate it. So now I would like to give uh, each candidate an opportunity for follow up for 30 seconds, and I'll go in the order in which I went the first time. So uh, Laura first. Thank you. So just to add to my previous comments, um, the other thing that I'd like to explore is expanding the county local school district partnerships. Um, there's some really great examples in school districts uh, right now, Jefferson Union High, for example, where um, they're working to uh, put teacher housing on public land. So I think that's a really interesting model. Um, and I've been in conversation with a couple of school board members about that and what that might look like. Um, the other um, piece to this is that um, if we make the circle bigger and allow people to live where they work, um, we'll reduce those greenhouse gas emissions too, and that's that's really important. So um, um, I think my time is up. That thirty seconds went really fast. Good to know. Yeah, Virginia. I, I really don't have that much to say, but I will say this: I think housing for our essential workers, including farm workers, our firefighters, our that's really important. I think they want to be in the community, and they should be in the community. I like what. Um, Community College District has done in terms of building housing and just as Steve said with the Jefferson Union High School District I, I kind of I guess kind of inserted my way into that uh, process because I was asked to, to help with that and um, I was glad to and I think we need to see more of that workforce housing. Thank you. Ray? Affordable housing is about human dignity and the one thing I'd say to, to those in the uh, community who'd resist it is you actually need to build affordable housing here on the coast if you want to save the coast. If you want to, if you actually love the coast for its for its open spaces, you need to do it because what's happening right now is you have uh, second generation, third generation farmers and ranchers who are, who are basically the the next in line is saying we can't do it, we don't have the labor, and you're going to see what's going to happen is those are going to be sold for highest and best use, and the development pressures will be tremendous. Thank you. Thank you, and Stephen. So I'm a, I'm a native. I was born and raised here in, in, in the Bay Area. I was actually born in San Francisco, but I'm a lifelong San Mateo County resident. Um, my daughter just turned 26, which means she's off my health care. And she's, she's a UC Berkeley student. And um, 
really important because I see my daughter and a lot of my friends that I grew up with that aren't able to live here anymore because of the high cost of uh, rents and, and housing. So I am definitely in favor of affordable housing at all affordability levels so that my friends and family members can continue to live in the county where they were born and raised. So thank you. Yeah. I, I just wanted to highlight how many people are here in the room, which is amazing. And uh, what you may not be able to see is that we also have some other people. We have at uh, the latest count, uh, 32 people at the Puente location and 60 people on Zoom. So that's amazing. And with that, I do want to take a step back now that we have all those people logged in and ask you to eat, uh, make an introductory statement and introduce yourself now that we are at peak attendance. Um, and uh, we're going to go uh, in this order, Virginia, Stephen, Laura, and, and Ray. So Virginia. Great. Thank Two you. minutes. Yes. Thank, how many minutes? Two, Two minutes. Okay. I'm Virginia Chang Corrali, and I'm your supervisor. As a resident of the unincorporated area of West Menlo Park, I've had the privilege of serving on two boards simultaneously, the San Mateo County Harbor District Board and the Menlo Park Fire Protection District Board. I am a daughter of Chinese immigrants. Uh, when my parents uh, fled communist China, they came here for a better life. So from the very beginning of my, of my time being on the, this earth, I was instilled with uh, the importance of education and hard work. I grew up in Austin, Texas, and I got my government degree from the University of Texas at Austin with a minor in economics and a master of public administration from the University of Southern California. My professional background is in finance, financial uh, analysis, investment, and business. I've been a fiscal watchdog, and um, I fought against waste, fraud, and tax dollars on the San Mateo County Civil Grand Jury. And I've also helped with shared prosperity for Californians on the California, California Commission for Economic Development. As the only candidate who has served both the coast side and the bay side, I know the diverse needs that our district has, and I believe that government should work for us and not stifle us. So um, I look forward to answering your questions tonight and beyond today. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen. Yes. Hello. My name is Stephen Booker. Um, there's a lot of familiar faces in the audience, but for those of you who don't know me, like I said previously, I'm a lifelong San Mateo County resident. I'm a native, and um, I've lived in a lot of cities in this in this county, from Daly City to Belmont to San Mateo, Emerald Hills, Woodside, and now I currently live in Half Moon Bay. Um, San Mateo County is one of the most diverse counties in, in, in the state of California, if not the nation. I'm also an Air Force vet. Um, I play soccer for the Air Force in Europe. I traveled halfway around the world and back. And like I said, this is the best place on God's green earth. Um, having said that, even in our wealthy and educated county, there, there are too many communities and people being left behind. Um, and COVID-19 made those divisions all the more evident. I'm running for San Mateo County Supervisor to build a more equitable county where everyone has a voice from the coast side to Menlo Park. San Carlos and everywhere in between. Um, we can and must do a better job to provide affordable housing, especially for our seniors, our veterans, and our essential workers like teachers and nurses. And we must ensure that every child has internet access to get ahead in our increasingly connected world. It is past time to build more trust between our community and our police and our law enforcement. And they need more funding for de-escalation techniques to stop all this um, mistrust in the community. Like I said earlier, I'm a lifelong San Mateo County resident who proudly lives in Half Moon Bay. I'm a United States Air Force Gulf War veteran. And today my job is standing up for workers' rights as the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers political director and the community affairs liaison. I believe that my unique background gives me a well-rounded experience throughout our diverse county and the ability to represent all the people in the third supervisory district. I look forward to earning your vote and hearing uh, more questions from you guys. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Laura. Hola. Como estas? Nice. Mi nombre es Laura. Thank you so much to the Leadership Council of San Mateo County and everyone for joining us this evening in this really important conversation. My name is Laura Parmer Lohan, and I am a working mom, small business owner, and a city council member for the city of San Carlos, having served last year as mayor. 
As your supervisor, I'll ensure that we're successful in addressing the devastating impacts of climate change. My leadership will bring people together to address the effects of severe drought in San Mateo County, reduce traffic that intensifies climate change, and protect our open spaces. As your supervisor, I'll tackle climate-induced flooding and sea level rise. I'm endorsed by local firefighters because they know that I'll fund year-round investment in wildfire prevention and improve our coastal protection. Working together, I pledge to end homelessness by expanding mental health, substance abuse, job training, and housing services. I want to ensure that we uh, have effective, community-empowered, accountable policing services. I want to ensure that our future generations can stay in San Mateo County and our teachers, firefighters, first responders, farm workers, and their families, and essential workers can live near where they work and be a part of the community that they serve. I am honored to be endorsed by the United Healthcare Workers, Equality California, and all of the preceding supervisors representing us, including current uh, seat holder, board president Don Horsley, and former supervisors Rich Gordon and Ted Lempert, as well Carol Groom has endorsed my campaign. They recognize my vision and leadership um, is the right one for the for the people of San Mateo County, and I, I do hope uh, that you'll agree with them after this conversation. Thank you. Ray? Good evening, everyone. So uh, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce myself as a dad. I'm, I'm married to my high school sweetheart, Kristen. We have two kids. Max is age 16. My daughter is, is name is, is L. She's 12 years old. She's going to be 13 in about a week, uh, which is incredible to me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley College of Natural Resources. I then went on to Hastings College of the Law, where I did work at the Public Law Research Institute. And then uh, I did an internship at the Legislative Council Bureau of Sacramento. And so really wanted to focus on doing public policy work at that time. And the reason why was because I came out of a family when I was very young, my dad had an injury uh, that made him become disabled. And I saw, I saw my mom have to go back to work to try to support our family. There were seven kids in the family. Uh, we Things very quickly, my older brother and sister got married. Their families came to live with us and we struggled. And I was old enough to know what was going, uh, I, was, I was old enough to know what was going on, but young enough to know I couldn't do anything about it. And so that drove me to do public policy work. I've done 10 years on the city council. I actually worked two years as chief of staff to a county supervisor. So I'm ready on day one for this job. And, I, and in terms of representing the coast, I haven't done it in an elected position, but I, I've been out here. I've volunteered and, I'm, and I've worked food pantries. I've, uh, I've, I've taught leadership classes for youth. I've done clothing drives for farm workers. I've worked uh, with city council members to try to find affordable housing sites. I've done wetsuit drives. Uh, I've, I'm sorry, I've, I taught the first ever uh, Latino surf camp uh, last year so that there'd be equity in our beaches and then ran a wetsuit drive to bring kid to bring wetsuits to those kids so they could continue to enjoy it. I serve on the Surf Rider Blue Water Task Force to go ahead and try to make sure that that we that the environment's protected here. I've worked, oh, I'm on the advisory board of Green Foothills and I've worked uh, with the El Granado, went up in El Granado with people trying to go ahead and address wildfire. I look forward to talking with you all about how I go ahead and bring equity to the coast. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ray. All right, so I am going to move uh, to a question that's been top of mind for many uh, around law enforcement. So what changes, if any, would you make to how the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office operates in the coastside communities? Do you support the establishment of a community oversight committee of the sheriff office? So it's a two part question. Um, and the first answer will be Ray, then we'll go to Virginia, Stephen, and Laura, followed by a 30 second follow up in that same order. Can you read the first part of the question again? What changes, if any, would you make to how the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office operates in the coastside communities? So that's the first part. Um, and the second part is, do you support the establishment of a community oversight uh, committee for the sheriff's office? Yeah, so I, I believe I'm the only person actually of a candidate to have endorsed, uh, that actually officially endorsed that there be an oversight committee. And I did that a, a few weeks back. Um, and so I do support that. I think it's, an, I think it's important actually uh, going forward with the sheriff's office to go ahead and build trust with the community. Uh, and it was one of the things, you know, 
we've been dealing with, I think every city has been dealing with this, but this always, this goes all the way back uh, in, in, in the city that I've served in all the way back to when, uh, when uh, Donald Trump was first election. And, and in my city, I, I actually was one, we were one of the first cities actually and only cities in San Mateo County to actually uh, pass a sanctuary city type ordinance. And I worked with my chief of police to do that and got buy-in from our police department to do that. And we were one of the only cities in the county to do that. We also joined the lawsuit uh, that, the, that Santa Clara County had against the Trump administration when they were trying to withhold funds from Santa Clara County for being a sanctuary county. Um, I, we also, I also uh, put forward that we would have, uh, 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 that we would have an ordinance that you couldn't participate in a Muslim registry because they were talking about doing that at the federal level. And we had members of our community who were fearful. And I think what it really comes down to is it's about trust. It's about building trust and relationship. And one of the reasons why it's so important that the, the sanctuary uh, ordinances are so important is because members of our community, whether or not they're citizens or not, they should not be afraid of interacting with the government from whom they, they're also, it's necessary that they be able to receive service, services from, or that they be able to, to report a crime, or that they be able to, or that they're, they're, that they're worried that if a member, if they actually are a victim of a crime and they report it on someone else, that that person's going to just, and that is, there's, there's so much important, uh, so much important about building that trust in the community. And, and one of the things that I think that has to happen at the sheriff's department right now is we have to go ahead and then, and build that trust, for instance, with the city council. But we also have to go ahead and we have to have police officers assigned to beats, actually interacting with community members, having, building that relationship uh, between community members and officers. One of the things that we often see happen uh, in this, and when you have a situation like this, is there's so much discussion about what's going to take place at a policy level between those who make policy. That doesn't change really anything. What happens is, are you creating programs that create relationships of trust between citizens and officers? And I'll tell you, citizens hunger for it, but the truth is, officers hunger hunger for that too. Sheriff, they they want officers want the resources to build those relationships because it makes their job easier when they're out in the public and they see what's happening. And I think that that's really what the what what it comes down to is actually the county being willing to invest. Right now, there's a terrible thing happening that I just heard about where we actually there we are so under resourced right now that they're having to make a decision of whether or not to send officers out to enforce domestic violent uh, domestic violence. Uh, restraining order cases because they don't want to charge overtime. We have to go ahead and make investments to, to, to build that trust. Thank you. Virginia? Yes, thank you for that question. So the first part of that question I think is really important uh, in terms of addressing mental illness and decriminalizing mental illness. So one of the things that I think that can be changed in the sheriff's office is to fund support services to, to fund support and education to help uh, in training to help the sheriff's office and actually any law enforcement officer to your uh, department to um, work with the community. So when there is a problem with someone who is in need of resources for mental health issues or mental illness issues, that is not a criminal action. Um, I am on the board of NAMI San Mateo County and I know that um, families need support. And one of the biggest complaints that I've heard is from some of our clients is that there hasn't been enough support and the working relationship with law enforcement has not been as great. So I, and I do think that um, law enforcement is under a lot of pressure to, to do what it needs to do to keep the street our streets safe and our community safe. But at the same time, they're not trained adequately um, for addressing mental illness issues and mental health issues. The, um, they're, they're off to a good start with the CARES program, uh, which I support. And also there are these crisis intervention, uh, crisis intervention training um, trainings that they have. But the Sheriff's Office also has this new program called Enhanced Crisis Intervention Training, which I hope that nonprofits will um, participate in with the Sheriff's Office. And it's something from what I understand from the Sheriff himself having talked to him, is, um, could be a model in the United in the US, in the United States. The Boston Police Department has come out and tried to understand what it is that works for um, ECIT and may actually uh, use that as a model. So I'm hoping that that will work. But that's going to take community buy-in, which I think is 
important. But at the end of the day, we have to be compassionate, not um, criminalize mental illness. In terms of a civic oversight community, I, I as a grand, former grand jury four person and member, I totally believe in accountability and transparency. So there needs to be something where um, where law enforcement can, can actually be accountable to the public. The um, the need for accountability, I think, is trying to they're trying to solve that with body cameras and um, reporting the paperwork that they're trying to do. But at the end of the day, they're also not staffed well enough. So uh, we, we just need to make sure that we're you know, they're accountable at the same time as you know, not being taxed under their staffing. Steven. Yes, um, that's a very good question. So a little bit about me. I told you guys earlier that I'm, a, I'm an Air Force vet. And after Desert Storm, I came back to California. I was stationed down in Castle because I realized I didn't want to make the Air Force a career. And I uh, started looking for jobs and opportunities here in California. And I started going to College of San Mateo as um, an administration of justice major. I actually wanted to be a police officer. Um, I figured I was in the Air Force, police departments of paramilitary groups. And so I was taking administration, administration of justice classes before someone talked me into taking the test to become an electrician, which I do now. Um, I say that to say that I wholeheartedly support our law enforcement agencies. Um, and as, as a black man or African-American, I don't know what's politically correct now. I usually say black, but whatever. You call me Steve. But um, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of defunding the police department. I'm actually a fan. I, I believe they need more resources. Um, I'm actually a fan of, of, of Citizens o o Oversight Committee. Um, I endorse Fixing San Mateo. And um, I'm on the board of directors for the San Mateo Police Activities League. And I'm actually on the board of directors for the Sheriff's Activities League. Um, I believe that representation matters and they need to see individuals that don't look like them. And some things that, you know, that I might do or I might say in these meetings might be cultural or they might, they might look at a different light and someone, so they might see it out on the streets and be like, well, I, I seen Steve do that. So it's not really threatening or that's not aggressive. That's just maybe it's passion and give them this, the benefit of the doubt. Um, I also believe that they need to have more mental health clinicians uh, traveling with them. I talked to us, there's, there's a pilot program going on where mental health clinicians go out with uh, police officers or, or the sheriff's office for nonviolent um, calls. And I've talked to some of our, uh, First responders, like in the fire department, they said it's been a really good um, outcome. It'll stop uh, police brutalities and unnecessary lawsuits, which usually happens to people of color and underrepresented uh, communities. So I am wholeheartedly in support of a, a community oversight committee, but I am wholeheartedly in support of our law enforcement agencies as well. I know they have a very tough job and a difficult job, and they deal with a segment of community that, that we don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. and that's why I believe they also need to have more access to, to therapy and the middle health access. So absolutely, I'm in favor of a citizens oversight committee. Thank you. Uh, Laura, thank you. Um, so the issue I, I think is, is this, and that is that many community members do not feel that protect and serve um, applies to them. Communities of color, uh, undocumented workers um, and immigrants or uh, documented immigrants. Um, that, that trust has been eroded. And at the same time, um, I recognize that policing is really difficult. We ask a lot of them, um, they go into situations and they don't know necessarily what they're gonna find. Uh, I've worked in healthcare my entire career. And I know that what is the most important thing uh, before determining an intervention is making sure that you have the proper diagnosis. Um, so we do need to make sure that our police uh, forces have the training that they need to understand and assess the situation that they're in and make sure that they have uh, the proper support um, to uh, tackle the issue that they're facing and help the community member that's in crisis. Um, uh, I was called upon um, as mayor of the uh, city of San Carlos to advocate for funding uh, for mental health training for our police officers so that they would better understand the context of some of these situations when they arose and I'm uh, pleased that uh, that $350,000 was allocated to the San Mateo County Sheriff. Um, so uh, that action was something that I, I uh, am, am a firm believer in. The CAHOOTS model um, out of the Northwest I think is also a really good model and that that again is where you 
uh, intervene with um, uh, social workers and, and people with mental health uh, capabilities. Uh, the issue with community oversight, I have endorsed uh, Fix in San Mateo, which is about a community oversight model uh, that has subpoena power. And um, uh, they've, they're asking the Board of Supervisors this year uh, to take that action and adopt that. Um, and um, if they don't, then it will go uh, next year potentially to the ballot. But um, if I'm elected, perhaps <laughs> we can get it done if this Board of Supervisors doesn't, because uh, I'm committed to that as well. And, and part of what this is about is a call for metrics. Let's understand um, the uh, use of force. Let's understand racial profiling. And um, if there's an issue, let's let's identify it, let's call it what it is and uh, provide the appropriate corrective action to make sure that, that it stops. Um, I wanna make sure that um, everyone feels um, that they are served um, by our uh, policing services. Um, and, um, and the other piece to this too is uh, the ICE action that was taken, um, the cooperation with ICE, um, that has since ceased, um, but that was a long overdue. Uh, those uh, people were often put in double jeopardy situations, which, which I think was inappropriate and unfair. Um, and I know where my son goes to high school, um, many of those families would be concerned um, when there was local ICE action happening and a whole triage effort to try to keep families together uh, would be undertaken. And no high school student or any child uh, should go through that type of year. Thank you. Thank you. So now you have 30 seconds of follow up, um, Ray. Well, first I wanna to apologize to my colleagues because I hadn't realized that they had uh, endorsed Fixin, uh, which uh, they had, they did now. But, so I'll say I was the first to do it. <laughs> so, um, but no, all, all the point, honestly, all the points that, that my colleagues have raised on this uh, are, are great. And, and I, I also, I, I wasn't able to mention it, but I obviously I, I do support actually bringing the, the current county pilot, which is bringing mental health, uh, mental health workers all to to these uh, to these sites that require them so that you can de-escalate. The other thing that that no one's touched upon that I think we should, that I think everyone would agree with is we also need to go ahead and actually try to look at implementing more technologies so that you're actually decreasing uh, when there's an actual interaction take, taking place unless it's absolutely necessary. Those are those are, those unnecessary interactions sometimes can lead to an unnecessary. Interaction. Right. Uh, Virginia? Just really quickly, I think I have a unique perspective as an Asian American, Chinese American woman. Um, law enforcement needs to be supported at the end of the day. Um, the police on the, on the streets and on the beats, they're you know, dealing with a lot of tough issues, racial issues. And as a Chinese American woman, um, I am, I've been very hurt and distressed by the Asian violence that we've seen in this country. So maybe I have a different perspective on law enforcement, but I do support what they've done for the Asian community in terms of um, protecting us over the last couple of years. Thank you, Virginia. Stephen? So we've had a, a few incidents in the San Mateo County. We had one actually here in Half Moon Bay well, anniversary is coming up on a Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, where a, a lady was shot in the parking lot of Pasta Moon. We had an incident in a Millbury or Burlingame where someone was tased to death, which was for, for jaywalking. Um, and, and, the, and when the community had uh, disdain and went to the Board of Supervisors to talk about everything that was 30 seconds already. It goes fast. <laughs> I just want to say that they, they approved a, a, a contract for tasers without even doing a moratorium. And I just thought that was appalling with, with all the outcry from the communities. So thank thank you. you. Yep. Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, Laura? I, I just want to say that um, I, I think working together, um, we can keep the peace and restore confidence um, across the community. And um, I'm looking forward to being able to play a role in that, uh, should you allow me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So I am about to ask the last question, but before I do that, um, um, last question in, in this section, there'll be another section for uh, questions that were submitted by the public in the chat. And so, but before I ask the last question, I just uh, wanted to remind everybody here and at Puente and on Zoom to submit your questions via the chat feature so that we have an opportunity to review them um, 
for uh, the second section. If you are in the room here, uh, we have index cards as well. So if you prefer to write your questions down on an index card, please write it down and then we'll pass it to the front. Um, so um, the third question and last question, important question, uh, actually, as a matter of fact, tonight, uh, the Rolo Unified District is meeting. They have their school board meeting. So the last question is on education. What do you see as some of the unique challenges faced by the Coastside School District, Cabrillo Unified, La Honda Pescadera, and Pacifica. So that's the first part of the question about the unique challenges. And the second part is how would you advocate for increased education funding for San Mateo County Schools? And we'll go to this order, Stephen, then Laura, then Ray, Virginia. Stephen? That's a very good question. So one of the reasons I decided to run for Board of Supervisors was during the pandemic. I had I had students outside of my house using my Wi-Fi because they didn't have Wi-Fi and they still had to try to do distant learning. So one of the unique challenges that I see on the, on the coast side is, is the lack of, of a broadband or internet access, um, especially, like I said earlier, in this ever, ever connected world. We live in the backyard of, of, of Silicon Valley. But yet we have our, our students that can't get internet access and can't do distant learning. Um, and that's 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 just that's a travesty, you know. Um, we need we need to do something. We need to have um, pipelines like we have apprenticeship programs for for labor, for electricians, for plumbers, uh, for carpenters and so on and so forth. I, I believe we need to have the same thing for, for tech workers. Um, we need to have an apprenticeship for, for them so individuals that don't necessarily go to four-year colleges will will be able to make a decent living and, and be sustainable and be a productive member of society especially here in san mateo county um i just want to say once again i am not knocking four-year universities in no way shape or form my daughter goes to uc berkeley and um but i didn't so i i know the values of uh uh uc berkeley education but also know the the value of a uh, hard work and someone who goes to the military and, and comes out and goes to college and and then joins a the trade. So um, I would definitely advocate for for uh, a more connected world, especially here on the coast. Okay, thank you. Um, and and um, that that's great. Um, and uh, the the question is also about the schools, um, Cabrillo Unified, La Honda, and Pacifica um, that are here um, locally. So uh, Laura. Yeah, so um, so my wife actually uh, raises money for a local school district. She's the, edu um, the executive director of the Education Foundation. And um, through her uh, work, I've come to learn that our funding model for our schools is completely inadequate and broken. <laughs> and I've already started advocating with our state legislatures, and that conversation has been going on for some time. Um, you know, I, I hope that they have the courage to step up and lean into this, um, because it's very unfortunate that in one neighborhood, um, a school uh, will be allocated $9,000 per child, and then uh, 10 blocks away, 18000 So let's talk about that equity gap, and that stays with that child uh, their entire uh, educational career. Um, and it's a real shame because in the state of California, we have incredible resources to us. It was one of the reasons that my family moved to San Diego um, when I was a small kid. Um, there was four of us, and my mom valued education deeply, but on my dad's income, she knew that she wasn't going to be able to put us all through college. But for us, California was that chance and that ticket. But that's not true for everybody in our community. Um, so we really need to take a look at that funding model. Um, uh, in addition, um, I understand, um, and it was raised in one of the questionnaires uh, that was sent uh, in advance, was this idea of um, open space and protecting open space, and that those dollars go into these uh, trusts, and then that dollar, those dollars come out of that tax revenue that pays for the schools. I don't think these things have to be mutually exclusive. I think we can continue with our open space uh, trusts, but we also need to figure out a way to fund our schools adequately. Um, in addition, um, the high school in Pescadero doesn't have running clean water and hasn't for 10 years. I know that there's efforts underway uh, to try to get that uh, re resolved, um, but the fact that our local high school doesn't have running water um, is very concerning to me. And you have my commitment that I will continue to work on that issue and, and get that resolved. Um, the other piece that I think we can play is um, county and local school partnerships uh, to uh, invest in workforce training. 
Again, we have um, many resources here, um, the trades that um, uh, my opponent uh, or colleague, as he likes to call us, <laughs> uh, talks about. Uh, we need to encourage people to pursue those. Those are good paying jobs. Uh, it's skilled labor. Uh, but right now, it's not an obvious choice for our high school students. Um, in addition, I want to increase access to our local community colleges as well as our four-year colleges. Um, and I'm hoping that um, our funding for uh, higher education um, gets restored over time as well, because I understand the state of California is not necessarily meeting uh, their obligations where that's concerned. And STEM is a huge component of this. Uh, we live in Silicon Valley. We have a rich biotech industry. And we need to make sure uh, that our students have the proper education so that they can participate uh, in the job rich uh, community that we're all a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Ray. Thank you. So uh, I've been endorsed by four to five Cabrillo Unified School District members, and my wife actually is a middle school. And what I'd say, uh, there's a whole bunch of issues that need to be addressed. Number one, housing costs for teachers is just causing a tremendous amount of stress and pressure on our school districts. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, Wi-Fi access for students is, is unequal. It needs to be addressed uh, and invested in. But I think what really we need to talk about is what is the goal? Is the goal that we have like resources or is the goal true equity? Because equity in education isn't like resources, it's equity in outcomes. And that's what the goal needs to be if we're really providing equity to students. Are we getting equity in what the outcome is for each student? Are they all, are they all having similar outcomes in terms of what they've learned and what opportunities are available to them? And that's what we that needs to be what the goal is when we invest resources. And so one of those things that you talk about is, well, the legislature, we need to go and tell them, hey, what the, because of the cost of living here, what you give to our school here uh, per student and compared to what you give in Fresno, it needs to be different because it, the cost of living here is so much higher. And so we need to get the legislature to do that. But it's not just on the legislature. It turns out we can have a joint powers agency in San Mateo County. And I've talked with law firms to find out it's legal or Carrington in San Francisco, where we create a joint powers agency that takes revenue from development and other, and other, uh, other, other types of uh, revenue creating uh, opportunities, put that into the joint into the joint powers agency and then redistribute it to underserving uh, underserving school districts. And that's something that we absolutely have to do if we're ever going to move the needle. And then and then what the question is, okay, after you've done that, and actually have you started to create that equity in our school districts, what comes next? And so a great example is in Pescadero right now, if you want to go to community college, one, can you afford it? And two, can you get there? Is there public transit that can actually get you there in time and get you back? And there's not. Is there an express shuttle that can take you to the community? college and bring you back. And those are the types of things when you're designing the program that you can go get that you actually then you look at when you're saying, are we getting equity in the outcome from that student and the opportunity for that student? And I see Nancy McGee here, our superintendent of schools, and she is wonderful. I know how much she works on these things. She's a true partner in that. I'm proud to be endorsed by her in this race. And those are the types of things that as a county supervisor, I'm going to be focused in. We've spent a lot of time in the county focusing on the start of education. Uh, and how we're going to how we're trying to get uh, uh, pre-kindergartners up to up to speed. We have to focus on now: Are we getting our middle schoolers? Are we getting those people moving in, into high school ready to go so that they get those equitable outcomes at the end, and they're getting the investment necessary to get there? Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Education is, I think, the great equalizer. And as I said, my parents immigrated here. And uh, it stressed the importance of education and hard work. Um, funding is definitely a problem, and the inequitable, the inequities from funding uh, definitely need to be straightened out. Um, but everyone's talked about funding, but I'm, I want to talk about uh, how do you make a student's life a little easier? I'm a former PTA president, Los Alamitos Elementary School PTA. But I've also been on two foundation boards, the Los Lamitas Education Foundation Board and the Sequoia High School Education Foundation Board. And it's night and day in terms of the money that we raise. But the money that is raised can go to programs that will make a student education much more enriched. Um, for me, education is, in, this is what we taught our, my two sons um, who ended up going to Sequoia High School because I, I felt like they needed to have a different um, set of uh, friends also so they can education just isn't about you know being in a 
an affluent area. Education is a broad, um, broad journey, if you will. Uh, but um, how do you make life easier? It could be lunches. I, mean, we, I helped start the school lunch program at uh, within, the Los Amigos, within the Los Amigos School District. And it made all the difference in the world. Even the kids who were on free and reduced lunches, the lunch um, program, it didn't even matter. They still got lunches. And you know everyone ate together. Now, how do you make a student's life a little easier? It could be funding or help funding the um, after school programs in Pacifica, for example. Aisha, you mentioned up, up north, Boys and Girls Club there is in danger of being closed. And uh, there are a lot of unintended consequences. Where, where are these children going to go? I've been kind of helping them and advising them on you know, how what we can do to that valuable community resource open for children. So there's that. There's the, um, I mean, even in Pescadero, if you look at, you know, I think it was one of y'all said potable water. When I was on the grand jury in 2007, 2008, we actually did a report on the La Honda Pescadero School District. And that was before we knew that there wasn't potable water, if you can believe that. But uh, infrastructure in general in Pescadero, I mean, you can't even get a porta potty there. It takes five years and, you know, to get two porta potties, which I think is neglectful and shameful. So how do you make a student's life easier? Universal broadband. Uh, I heard from Carrie Dubois, who's the president of the Sequoia Union High School District Board, who, which is probably one of the most diverse school districts in the county, serving East Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Atherton, San Carlos. She's a supporter. We talked about the need to equalize technology accessibility. So all of these things to make a student's life easier is something I would support and fund. Thank you. So we'll now give each of you an opportunity for follow-up. Uh, Stephen. Yes, thank you. I just want to say that um, I am also endorsed by Nancy McGee, the San Mateo County Office of Education Superintendent, because she knows my work throughout the community. I travel far and wide to make sure that every child in this, in this county has an opportunity. I go to Pescadero, I go to adult facilities, I go to juvenile detention facilities. Um, education is really important and we need to make sure that everyone has an opportunity, whether they wanna to go to a four-year university or whether they wanna to go to the trades or whether they wanna be in, in tech or whether they wanna be an artist. We have to make meet those individuals where they are and make sure that we're funding every child so they have an opportunity in, in this wealthy community. It's wealthy county, and um, my time is up. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm excited about our future. Um, San Mateo County uh, has uh, great resources, incredible ideas, and um, I think it's important uh, that we invest in our kids uh, because they are our future. And you have my commitment when I'm elected to supervisor uh, to work in close partnership with the various school districts uh, to realize that vision. Thank you. Thank you. Ray? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on, because I, I think it's important to not only focus on equity and outcomes, but also equity and experience. So when you're talking about whether or not kids are getting access to mental health uh, in schools, are they getting access to the same level of enrichment programs? Are they experiencing life in a manner where they're actually being a, fully developed just outside, even outside the academic world? That's one of the reasons why I worked on that surf camp. Because there's so much that ha that relates to mental health. If you want, if, is a child actually being treated as a, as a part of the community and their learning experience? Do they have that dignity? That's what our goal is. Yeah. So extracurricular activities is definitely enriching for children, and I I understand that the Half Moon Bay High School probably could use a new swimming pool and aquatic center. I I agree. Sports, music. I was um, on the board of the El Camino Youth Center understand the need and totally support the need to have partners with um, with nonprofits and these types of enriching programs. But even for something as basic as water polo or swimming, those things are great for kids physically and mentally. And so I would want to provide that support just like Half Moon Bay and worked with the county to build this beautiful library. Thank you all very here, much. Here. Um, just a reminder, now we're going to start uh, the final 30 minutes of this evening's presentation. And if anyone has questions that you'd like to write down on a card and uh, pass up 
uh, Ken. He's walking around the room. Others have submitted questions uh, live online through the Q&A feature. And now we will have something like a lightning round. You have one minute to respond to the following questions. Um, Susan will keep time and then you'll be able to follow up with a 30 second follow up after that, the same, same basic format as the first hour. So our first question is going to go to Virginia and then Stephen, Laura, and Ray. Read the question twice. This is from online. Three of the four candidates are from over the hill. How will you represent our community with the same concern, intent, and enthusiasm that you would in your own home community? How will you address issues that are specific to the coast this is especially important to those of us in the unincorporated areas from Montera, Moss Beach, and El Granada to La Honda and Pescadero that do not have any other representation. This lack of representation was especially apparent during the first summer of the pandemic when our community was overrun with tourists and we had no additional support and couldn't get it. Previous promises of a local office have not panned out. What will you do? Are you reading that question twice? <laughs> I can answer the three, question. Three of the four of you are from over the hill. How will you represent our community with the same concern, intent, and enthusiasm that you would in your own home communities? How will you address issues that are specific to the coast? This is especially important to those of us in the unincorporated areas, such as Montera, Moss Beach, El Granada, La Honda, and Pescadero, that don't have any other representation. This lack of representation was especially apparent. Our community was overrun with tourists, and we had no additional support and couldn't get it. Previous promises of a local office have not panned out. What will you do? I actually live in the unincorporated area. So I feel your pain uh, of not being as represented as we should be, which is the reason that I have done what I think as, as much as I can and, and I need to do more as a Harbor Board Commissioner for the last six and a half years. Uh, we have fixed the coastal trail going out to Mavericks. We've supported our commercial fishing industry I mean, all of these things we've we've done in uh, the six and a half years and other things as well that we've done. But um, being present here, I've been present here almost every day uh, for the last six and a half years, and I will continue to be present. I've had office hours, People know how to get a hold of me. I'm not going anywhere. If, when I'm your supervisor, nothing's going to change with me. I've been out here and I continue to I will continue to be out here. Thank you. Next is Stephen, then Laura and Ray. Well, I guess that individual was talking about me when they said three of the four don't live on the coast. Um, I'm, I'm here every day. I, I, I actually work on the, over the hill. And if I'm supervisor, I will continue to work over the hill. And I will still live here in uh, Half Moon Bay. Opening an office, I know, I know Ray's talked about opening an office here. In, in, on the coast. Um, I have a little bit of a different idea. I don't really know if that's uh, allowed in the budget, but I would coordinate with different cities for uh, community centers or their city halls or senior centers, um, uh, different days of the month for Pescadero, La Honda, Pacifica, so on and so forth. But like I said, I'm here, I'm here every day. So, and I see a lot of you in the audience, you guys know where to find me, probably on Main Street somewhere. It's Italia or Pasta Moon and uh, sometimes it's San Benito. But uh, yeah, I'm here every day, all day, twice on Sunday. Thank you. Laura, you're next. Okay, thank you. Um, so if, if it's the will of the community for an office to be set up and opened here, then so be it. Um, we'll do that for sure. Um, I think it's important. Everybody's busy. I don't expect you to come to me. I'll come to you. I spend most of my time on the camp tra campaign trail actually out on the coast. To me, this is where the majority of the work is. Um, you can reach me by, by phoning me at any time, 
0059. That's my direct line. Um, iPhone puts it on a notification at night, so I do get some rest, um, but I'm, I'm available to you. Um, like I do in my um, hometown where I live, I hold meet and greets and coffees and, and town halls uh, to stay connected with the community. As well, I've been attending a lot of the different community advisory council meetings uh, that happen up and down the coast, so I can stay apprised of the issues and the concerns uh, that, that you all have. And I look forward to working in partnership with you uh, should I have the opportunity to earn your support. Thank you. Ray? Yeah, so I'm a little different in this. I'm enthusiastic about wanting the office on the coast. It's not, it's, it's we need an office on the coast. And, and, uh, and I've already spoken to the county manager about that. I've sat down, we've talked about it and he's committed to me, he will do it. And the reason why is you need, I want that staff, I, I actually want it fully staffed. I want a staff member always in that office. I'll be in it at least three days a week or two days a week because representation is about relationship at the local level, it really is. People, you know, if someone, I grew up in a family that needed help. And if, you know what, I did not have time to go to Redwood City. People who need help don't have time to go to Redwood City. And what you really want to have happen is they're not gonna go, I really want them to have the relationship with my office that people don't need to feel like they need to make the appointment. But if there's something wrong, they know they can come and get the help. And that's the relationship that you should have with the coast. And that's the relationship that we have a great, we have great supervisor, we have great supervisor staff, but I want to deepen that relationship here where, where people know if you need help, you can come and have that relationship with me. And if you want to yell at me, you can come in there and yell at me. I'm not, uh, not so far away. Thank you. Uh, you each have 30 seconds to add any thoughts. So first is Virginia. Yes, so local economic development is something that I care about a lot. The coast side needs revenues. Uh, there are things that we can do. Uh, tourism is a big deal, but at the same time, was, I think part of the question was about the pandemic. It was not an easy thing. And the, coast, the, the um, Harvard District actually had to deal with all of the visitors. We had to deal with social distancing. We had to make sure that you know people who wanted to come out here to buy fish, I think mean, it's one of the best parts of being on the coast, had the opportunity and the ability to do this without um, spreading the virus around. So all of these things are important, but these are things that I've already worked on and I will continue to work on this, and represent everyone on the coast as I've done. Thank you, Stephen, you're next. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> this is, uh, this was the long question, right? About representation on the coast from Montero to Pescadero. Uh, the lack of representation has been apparent. What will you do to reach out to people on the coast side? I thought and I answered that one out? already. This is oh, this is oh, I'm sorry. So uh, this one's 30 seconds. This is 30 seconds. All right. Sorry. Sorry for the confusion. Um, once again, I, I agree with Ray. You, ha you have to meet people where they are. Um, and like I said, I live here on the coast. I'm, I'm available. You'll see me. But um, you can't have you can't have city council meetings or I'm sorry, board of supervisor meetings at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday. So we have to have meetings at other times where individuals who are workers can can come and meet with their supervisor. And like I said, I will be more than happy to coordinate that with different cities, Pescadero, La Honda, Pacifica, um, different weeks, different nights so that everyone has access to their supervisor. Thank you. Laura, any follow up? Um, 650-743-0059, call me anytime. Um, I will come to where you live and work and we'll have a conversation. And I'll also host various meetings. And again, if the community really wants an office, we'll absolutely open an office. Thank you. Ray? Yeah, so I just wanted to share my, rep my vision of representation for the coast has partially, I would say, contributed to the fact that I've been endorsed by every Half Moon Bay City Council member plus two former by every Pacifica City Council member plus five former current uh, for, uh, five former council members and mayors, uh, the entire uh, um, Mid Pen Regional Open Space District. I mentioned this, the school board members. What I really what I really want to do is have a relationship with all of these uh, different electeds so that we can come together and it, and Redwood City doesn't feel that far away. It's actually here. The, the, the community comes together here to solve those problems, and then I represent it back. Thank you. Aisha and I have just decided that we're not going to do follow ups for this lightning round. It's a little confusing. So you'll you'll have a minute and a half. How does that sound? 
Um, our next question is from an audience member here, or actually two audience members here, and it's about co-side traffic. Co-side traffic is a mess. HMB City Council did a hearing two weeks ago on a $100 million tram project over Highway 92. What would you do to help co-siders resolve the traffic congestion on the 92 and Highway 1 after years and years of neglect? What specifically do you propose to alleviate traffic? And uh, this round will begin with Stephen, then Ray, then Virginia, and Laura. So first up, a minute and a half, Stephen. That's, that's the million dollar question. If uh, any one of us had that answer, I, I guarantee you we'd be supervisor on, gen, on June 7th with Christina plus one. Um, at, living on the coast and traveling 92 on highway one, um, the traffic is at times horrendous, especially during like pumpkin season or, or Christmas season when people are cutting down trees. And, and there's there's been thoughts or talks about Gondola, we mentioned that before. Um, I don't I don't know what the answer to that is. I know that we have to do something about traffic. It could be um, shuttles, um, preferably electric, that would help out uh, Prometheus uh, bus building company that's actually in Burlingame, which is a local company. Um, yeah, but traffic, we're not gonna widen Highway 92. We're not gonna widen Highway 1. So we have to do something, think outside the box. And that's where you engage with the community. I, I don't have the answer to that, but I'm willing to talk to people and, and, and I'm open to any ideas. Thank you. Ray? This sort of goes to the vision of what we have to do on the coast. And I haven't had a chance to talk about that yet, but what really what we really need to do with the coast is treat it as our Sonoma Napa Valley. And, 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 and what you really need to do is you have to actually tell people where to go to, and you need to, to build transit and then uh, alternative transit. And then you have to tell people how they can use it. And we're not doing that. What we say is, well, there's not enough ridership, so we don't need alternative transit. No, what you need to do is tell people when they come to the coast where you can park your car and where you can get on alternative transit to go up and down the coast. And that's something that's lacking right now. If I wanted to do that, I'd have no idea where to catch the shuttle or off and it came. We need different types of shuttles. We need express shuttles. We need shuttles that take different stops. This is the same way you would see if you were to go into an area like Napa, the Sonoma Valley, you didn't want to use your car. Uh, we need multi. We need to invest in our multimodal system. We need more pike lanes. We need that. We need actually to give people the ability to go up and down the coast if they bring bring their bike in a way that's 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 not that you don't need a pathfinder to tell you how to do it. You you can go ahead and see that. And we actually need to give people maps of how to do that when they come to the coast. And that would also tell people where to go when they're here, so we could support our local economy. And then I do have the vision long term of actually trying to build a system that would include the gondola system to bring people over the hill. I think that's actually something long term we're going to have to do. We're going to have to be creative and think outside the box in that way, because long term, all that's going to happen is you're going to have more and more pressure of people and population growth in the Bay Area. And so you have to be, you have to have the courage to build that system and think about it now. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Yes, so this $100 million gondola system, um, you know, maybe in way, way in the future, but certainly not like the high speed rail fiasco that we're dealing with right now. I'm probably the only person um, on this panel who's actually had to deal with the permitting process, which has been a nightmare. The permitting process for the Coastal Commission, the permitting process for the, the cities and the county. I, mean, I still am waiting to get an ADA bathroom approved by uh, with the with the permits, the Harbor District's approved it uh, with the permits from San Mateo County and the Surfers Beach improvement, green space and restroom improvements from the city of Half Moon Bay. But traffic should not be a headache in everyone's life. So something as simple as doing roundabouts at Capistrano or um, Coronado, you know, near one. Uh, we've got we've got roundabouts in the back streets in El Granada and Half Moon Bay. You know, so, you know, why not look at those to make our lives easier right now, not 20 years from now or 40 years from now. Uh, clean fuel express shuttles, I'd like that to, uh, to be an option as well. I would even look at water taxis. I mean, if we would need to get from Pillar Point Harbor down to, you know, San Gregorio, what can you do there? Water is uh, something that I think is an opportunity for traveling or for traffic um, mitigation. Uh, bikes, walking. I supported the Miramar Bridge. 
I gave public testimony to the Coastal Commission to support that so that we could literally fix that bridge that will uh, bridge the, all the communities. Thank you. Next is Laura. Thank you. So um, 60 to 70 percent of the people who live in San Mateo County drive out of the county to go to work and 60 to 70 percent of the people who live in or work in San Mateo County drive in. Um, so we talked a lot about housing earlier. I think it's important that we um, put housing where people live. And when you look at the majority of housing projects, they're on the public transit corridor on uh, the Bay side. And I think um, that's where the majority of housing needs to go because those are the job rich centers. Um, I also um, am a fan of bike and pedestrian improvements. I don't know if any of one of you have tried to cross Highway 1 lately, um, but I did uh, attempt it a couple weeks ago and it was terrifying. Um, we need to make sure that our bike and pedestrian infrastructure is safe and motivates people to uh, get out of their cars and use that type of transportation. We did that in San Carlos and we see that bike and pedestrian um, activity is up in our community, so it, it definitely can pay off. Um, in addition, we need to invest in our public uh, transportation infrastructure. When I looked at the SAM Trans plan, um, I noted that uh, public transportation stops uh, at Half Moon Bay. It doesn't go further south. Uh, we need to invest in smaller type vehicles um, uh, and have more frequent uh, routes uh, so that people can partake in that. Um, in addition, electric vehicle bikes is something that we're investing in. I'm a board member of Peninsula Clean Energy, and um, sales of those are up. Um, it's a great micro mobility tool. It runs on clean energy, and um, it can allow somebody to navigate uh, and traverse a community quite easily. So there's lots of different options. Thank you, Laura. We're just going to do one more question, and then we'll begin our closing. This is from the Q&A. Would you support an amendment to the San Mateo County Charter that requires the county to use an independent redistricting commission to review and set supervisorial district boundaries? The Board of Supervisors has ignored this uh, and ignored the community when they, when they were first formed. And again, this past year, when a coalition of community-based organizations presented a district map that would have increased the diversity of the Board of Supervisors, which has not had a person of color in 40 years. First up is Ray. Yeah, I would, but it would have, it would have, uh, I'd wanna make sure that it had control so it couldn't be influenced by political process. And so we actually just went through an independent redistricting process in my city and it went great. Uh, but I have heard of examples where it didn't. And so it really is, so the board really sitting down and setting, uh, setting forth goals to make sure it couldn't, it couldn't be swayed by politics and was truly, uh, truly independent would, would be something that'd be really important to me. Um, and since I have a little bit of time left, uh, one quick fix to traffic that would be really helpful to the coast coming out here so much is the construction at night. I cannot tell you how often you get stuck in traffic from the doing construction during the day and you're just thinking, why are they doing this during the day? <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Next is Laura, then Stephen and Virginia. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer that um, government um, should be by the people and for the people. Um, I wouldn't be here for you today in front of you today if it wasn't for redistricting um, or uh, district elections. Um, the cost to mount a campaign like this is enormous in terms of time and resources and money. And um, uh, there's a very real possibility that our Board of Supervisors will be all male in 2022 uh, November election. And, and that alone doesn't represent our district. Um, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community and I know what it feels like to be marginalized, uh, left behind, ridiculed. Um, and I take my work seriously um, and that's what informs my work. Um, it's about welcoming inclusivity and making sure that everyone in the community feels that they belong and that they're welcome, but most importantly have agency and participate in the process should they choose to. And those who can't choose to, we try to figure out, I try to always figure out a way to get the information and insights from those community members um, that are you know, working parents maybe or a single mom um, and make sure that uh, they have what they need. We have increased access to childcare in the city of San Carlos uh, because we took action on it. Um, when we did take action on it, one of my colleagues said that um, they had always known that childcare was an issue in the city of San Carlos, but never bothered to work on it until Laura and Sarah were elected. We've been incorporated since 1925, and I'm the sixth woman to be elected to city council in San Carlos. 
Um, I'll be the first working mom in recent memory to serve and the first out LGBTQ community uh, member, a female um, on the board of supervisors. Um, I understand what representation means and I'm here to serve you in that vein. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. So um, we recently had a committee doing redistricting and a lot of hard work went in that, a lot of hours spent and in my opinion to no avail. I am actually wholeheartedly in favor of that. There was a, um, a, a district that was drawn. It was a, a co-side district that I was highly in favor of. Um, nothing against my colleagues up here, but I'd be the only one here at this meeting tonight had one of those districts uh, uh, been approved. I don't think that politicians should pick their voters. The voters should pick their politicians. And when we have people go to work to do redistricting and are very thoughtful and had various options and maps and for our board of supervisors to to do with the minimal change was a, was a little disheartening basically i don't really think they listen to to the citizens of uh, district three or, or san mateo county so i'm definitely in favor of that and you can bet your bottom dollar that i have no hidden agenda what you see is what you get I'm here to serve. I'm a servant of the people, and uh, you wouldn't have that. In, you wouldn't have that issue with me. I'm here to listen and here to do the people's will. So, absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Virginia. I am in support of an independent redistricting committee, uh, without the politics. Actually, when I was the foreperson of the civil grand jury that wrote the report on stopping appointments to the board of supervisors, when we it became a very incestuous practice. Uh, we wrote the, the advisory letter to deal with possible uh, district elections because our board of supervisors does not reflect the demographics of this county. So um, in my opinion, this redistricting fiasco didn't really do the people's job, right? They, it, they disenfranchised the citizens who took the time to draw these maps and um, in my opinion, it was an abomination and a shame. Uh, and I never thought in my wildest dreams that it would be this political uh, after trying to make it less political on the grand jury when we wrote these, the report and the advisory letter. Diversity is a big issue for me. When I'm on the board of supervisors, I'll be the first Asian in the history of San Mateo County on this board. This, this county is a majority minority county right now under the 2020 or based off the 2020 uh, census with the Latinx community and the Asian community combined. This board, your elected representatives must reflect the diversity of this county, both racial and diversity of thought. And that's what I will bring to this board. Thank you. Thank you. So we now have come to the end of the question time and thank you for the very civil debate and for following all the rules. We apologize for not getting to all the questions. There are so many more questions that were submitted. So I'm, I'm sure that there are other forums and, de and debates where people will get to them. So you do have an opportunity now for a closing statement and uh, each candidate will get a minute for a closing statement. And uh, we'll go in this order, Laura, then Ray, then Virginia, then Steven. Laura, and in that closing statement, there is a question that I, that came up that I'm going to combine with Sid about what makes you proud to be part of this district. So address that as well in your one minute. What makes me proud to be part of this district is uh, the amazing people in this community. I've had the good fortune to meet so many of you um, along this uh, campaign trail, and um, it would mean the world to me to be able to serve you and represent you and your beautiful families on the board of supervisors. Um, again, um, I'm a working mom, small business owner, elected public servant, and corporate manager. I know how to solicit input, identify needs, and build and implement plans that provide measurable results. And I do that uh, in a collaborative way that holds great respect for the office. I understand the priorities and concerns of my neighbors across the district when it comes to wildfire abatement, sea level rise management, impacts of drought, addressing homelessness, and the importance of increasing access to affordable housing and childcare. I'm trusted to be able to carry out the responsibilities of this job uh, by the current and two immediate past office holders, Supervisor Don Horsley himself, former supervisors Rich Gordon, Ted Lempert, Supervisor Kel Groom. Um, 
That doesn't mean anything though without your support. I'm here to earn your vote. This isn't about endorsements. This is about working with you in community to build the community that we all wanna be a part of. And I hope that I've earned your trust. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, so uh, the kindness, uh, the empathy and the values of District 3 are something that are just, it's, 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 there's, I am so excited about where District 3 is now, but I am so excited about the promise and opportunity of where we can be if we come together and we work together to get there. It's uh, because of the empathy and the kindness and the values of the communities here. And, uh, and people say endorsements don't matter. I'm still going to share my endorsements because I think the aggregate of them do matter. And I've been endorsed by the Sierra Club, San Mateo County Democratic Party, the Coastside Democratic Party, the Labor Council, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo and Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, over 22 women, current and former elected women city council members from District 3 have endorsed me in this race and over 50 current and former city council members from this district. So those are people who have worked so hard every day to try to make it work and help people in this community and solve problems. And we're ready to do a partnership together. And I like to say, I'm, I'm not endorsed by the, by the supervisor, but I'm, I'm endorsed by those who are problem solving on the coast for the coast. And obviously with, uh, by San Mateo County API caucus and Dr. Belinda Ariaga. Thank you very much. Thank you. Virginia. I love the diversity of District 3 and how we can come together during the most troubling and horrific times during the wildfire and during the pandemic. The CCU lightning fire brought our communities together, uh, not just on the coast side, but on the base side as well, when there was a real threat that it could go over the hill and the La Honda Fire Brigade stopped that. Um, as someone who's been a part of the coast side community and represented our interests for the last six and a half years, it's safe to say that we deserve someone who is an independent thinker and a courageous leader. Uh, I am that person. I will not represent special interest or be an extension of someone else's legacy. My work speaks for itself during the time I represented the Coast Side on the Harbor Board. And I ask that you continue to work with me in making our county, this district, and the Coast Side even greater and more inclusive. I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, Stephen. I am so proud to be a resident of San Mateo County, simply for the, for the diversity, the abundance of wealth that we have sitting up here on this panel, as well as the abundance of wealth that we have in our community from the tech worker to the farm worker, from the CEO to the intern and everyone in between. Um, we're, we're very fortunate. I've, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just happy to be here. As you notice, a lot of us have the same answers on some of the questions. We just have different ways of going about them. Um, I've said previously, some of us take one on one, some of us take 280. But one thing you guys have noticed is that we all respect each other. We all work with each other. I've had lunch with Ray. I've had breakfast with Virginia. I think I think me and Laura, we, we, we need to have a date, Laura. I don't think we, we have one yet. So um, I, I'm, I'm happy that you're, we're all cordial, we're all professional, and we all want what's best for, for District 3. And um, I'm just happy to be a resident of the Coast Side and to be born in, in the best county in the, in the nation, in my opinion. So uh, thank you for this, this forum, and thank you to my colleagues. And um, no, matter, no matter who you choose, but I hope you choose me, but no matter who you choose, you guys cannot go wrong. So thank you for this opportunity, and thank you to my friends up here with me. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Margie Power, and on behalf of Leadership Council, San Mateo County, let's give our candidates another big round of applause for participating. Thank you so much. We'd also like to thank our moderators this evening, Aisha Barrow and Eric Debody. Can you both please stand? I feel like you're not, we wanna make sure you get uh, recognition. Wonderful job. And we also want to thank the, the many volunteers who helped prepare for this evening and during this forum. They're all participants in the Leadership Council SMC Leadership Corps Cross-Sector Leadership Program for Senior Leaders. And 
if you all could uh, raise your hand so everyone can see who you are. There was a lot of preparation that went into this evening. Anita, Susan. Thank you. And uh, this bilingual candidate forum is the result of their work in the program. So we'd also like to make a couple of announcements about the next, uh, about the election that is coming up on June 7th. It might be frozen. Um, we have an election coming up on June 7th and the voting centers will be opening up early on May 9th. So if you need to register to vote, you can go in person to do that or you can go on the website uh, at SMC, you guys know what it is, right? SMC vote. Okay, we're gonna get it up here on the, on the uh, slideshow here. Here's all the information. The vote center is open May 9th. The election is June 7th. It's absolutely imperative that you all participate. That is the most important thing that we, we want to um, uh, drive home tonight. And um, also, we have some candidate forums coming up that are going to be hosted by Thrive Alliance of Nonprofits. Uh, if you use the QR code, you can go directly to their website and get those dates. There is a sheriff candidate forum coming up on May 12th at 6.30 via Zoom. So please go to their website to get more information about their, these forums. And thank you so much again for joining us this evening. Good night. <laughs>